Watch us on YouTube and Facebook. Listen to our podcast and support us on Patreon. Thanks for stopping by. This preface leaves no doubt of Longinus' final verdict. He ranks Plotinus and Aemilius above all authors of his time in the multitude of questions they discuss. He credits them with an original method of investigation. In his judgment, they by no means took their system from Numenius or gave the first place to his opinions, but followed the Pythagorean and Platonic schools. Finally, he declares the writings of Numenius, Cronius, Moderatus, and Thrasyllus greatly inferior in precision and fullness to those of Plotinus, that while Aemilius described as following in Plotinus' footsteps, it is indicated that his temperamental prolixity led him to delight in an extravagance of explanation foreign to his master, in the reference to myself, though I was then only at the beginning of my association with Plotinus Basilius of Tyre, my friend is theirs, who has written a good deal has taken Plotinus as his model Longinus recognizes that I entirely avoided Aemilius' unphilosophical prolixity and made Plotinus' manner my standard. Such a pronouncement upon the value of Plotinus' work, coming from so great an authority, the first of critics then as now, must certainly carry weight, and I may remark that if I had been able to confer with him during such a visit as he proposed, he would not have written to combat doctrines which he had not thoroughly penetrated, but why talk, to use Hesiod's phrase, about oak and rock, if we are to accept the evidence of the wise who could be wiser than a god? And here the witness is the same god that said with truth, I have numbered the sands and taken the measure of the sea. I understand the dumb and hear where there has been no speech. Apollo was consulted by Aemilius, who desired to learn where Plotinus' soul had gone. And Apollo, who uttered of Socrates that great praise, of all men, Socrates the wisest you shall hear what a full and lofty oracle Apollo rendered upon Plotinus. I raise an undying song, to the memory of a gentle friend, a hymn of praise woven to the honey-sweet tones of my lyre under the touch of the golden plectrum. The muses, too, I call to lift the voice with me in strains of many-toned exultation, in passion ranging over all the modes of the song. Even as of old they raised the famous chant to the glory of Eacides in the immortal ardors of the Homeric line. Come, then, sacred chorus, let us intone with one great sound the utmost of all song, I Phoebus, Bathicates, singing in the midst, celestial, a man at first but now nearing the diviner ranks. The bonds of human necessity are loosed for you and, strong of heart, you beat your eager way from out the roaring tumult of the fleshly life to the shores of that wave-washed coast free from the thronging of the guilty, thence to take the grateful path of the sinless soul, where glows the splendor of God, where right is throned in the stainless place, far from the wrong that mocks at law. Oft times as you strove to rise above the bitter waves of this blood-drenched life, above the sickening whirl, toiling in the midmost of the rushing flood, and the unimaginable turmoil, oft times, from the ever-blessed, there was shown to you the term still close at hand, oft times, when your mind thrust out awry, and was like to be wrapped down unsanctioned paths, the immortals themselves prevented, guiding you on the straight going away to the celestial spheres, pouring down before you a dense shaft of light that your eyes might see from amid the mournful gloom. Sleep never closed those eyes, high above the heavy murk of the mist you held them, tossed in the welter, you still had the vision, still, you saw sights many and fair not granted to all that labor in wisdom's quest. But not that you have cast the screen aside, quitted the tomb that held your lofty soul, you enter at once the heavenly consort, where fragrant breezes play where all is unison, and winning tenderness, and godless joy, and the place is lavish of the nectar streams the unfailing gods bestow, with the blandishments of the loves, and delicious airs, and tranquil sky. Where Minus and Radamanthus dwell, great brethren of the golden race of mighty Zeus, where dwell the just Iacus, and Plato, consecrated power, and stately Pythagoras, and all else that form the choir of immortal love, that share their parentage with the most blessed spirits, there where the heart is ever lifted in joyous festival. 
O oh blessed one, you have fought your many fights, now, crowned with unfading life, your days are with the ever holy. Rejoicing muses, let us stay our song and the subtle windings of our dance, thus much I could but tell, to my golden lyre of Plotinus, the hallowed soul, good and kindly, singularly gentle and engaging, thus the oracle presents him, so, in fact, we found him. Sleeplessly alert Apollo tells pure of soul, ever striving towards the divine which he loved with all his being, he labored strenuously to free himself and rise above the bitter waves of this blood-drenched life, and this is why to Plotinus godlike and lifting himself often, by the ways of meditation, and by the methods Plato teaches in the banquet, to the first and all-transcendent God that God appeared, the God who has neither shape nor form, but sits enthroned above the intellectual principle and all the intellectual sphere. There was shown to Plotinus the term ever near, for the term, the one end, of his life was to become uniate, to approach to the God over all, and four times, during the period I passed with him, he achieved this term, by no mere latent fitness, but by the ineffable act. To this God, I also declare, I pour free, that in my sixty-eighth year I too was once admitted, and I entered into union. We are told that often when he was leading the way, the God set him on the true path again, pouring down before him a dense shaft of light. Here we are to understand that in his writing he was overlooked and guided by the divine powers. In this sleepless vision within and without, the oracle says, Your eyes have beheld sights many and fare not vouchsafe to all that take the philosophic path. Contemplation in man may sometimes be more than human, but compare it with the true knowing of the gods and, wonderful though it be, it can never plunge into the depths their divine vision fathoms. Thus far the oracle recounts what Plotinus accomplished, and to what heights he attained while still in the body. Emancipated from the body, we are told how he entered the celestial circle where all is friendship, tender delight, happiness, and loving union with God, where Minos and Radamanthus and Iacus, the sons of God, are enthroned as judges of souls not, however, to hold him to judgment, but as welcoming him to their consort to which are bidden spirits pleasing to the gods Plato. Pythagoras and all the people of the choir of immortal love, there were the blessed spirits have their birth home, and live in days filled full of joyous festival, and made happy by the gods. I have related Plotinus' life, something remains to tell of my revision and arrangement of his writings. This task he had imposed upon me during his lifetime, and I had pledged myself to him, and to the circle to carry it out. I judged that in the case of treatises which, like these, had been issued without consideration of logical sequence it was best to disregard the time order. Apollodorus, the Athenian, edited in ten volumes the collected works of Epicharmus, the comedy writer, Andronicus, the peripatetic, classified the works of Aristotle and Theophrastus according to the subject, bringing together the discussions of related topics. I have adopted a similar plan. I had fifty-four treatises before me. I divided them into six sets of nine, an arrangement which pleased me by the happy combination of the perfect number six with the nines. To each such any ad I assigned matter of one general nature, leading off with the themes presenting the least difficulty. The first Ennead, on this method, contains the treatises of a more ethical tendency, on the animate and the man, on the virtues, on dialectic, on happiness, whether happiness depends on extension of time, on beauty, on the primal good and secondary forms of good, on evil, on the reasoned withdrawal from life. The second Ennead, following the more strictly ethical first, is physical, containing the disquisitions on the world, and all that belongs to the world, on the world, on the circular movement, whether the stars have causal operation, on the two orders of matter, on potentiality and actuality, on quality and form, on coalescence, why distant objects appear small, against those declaring the creator of the world, and the world itself, to be evil. The third Ennead, still keeping to the world, 
discusses the philosophical implications of some of its features. On Fate, the first treatise on Providence, the second treatise on Providence, on our tutelary spirit, on love, on the impassibility of the bodiless, on eternity and time, on nature, contemplation, and the one, various questions. These first three Enneads constitute, in my arrangement one self-contained section. Treatise on our tutelary spirit is placed in the third Ennead, because this spirit is not discussed as it is in itself, and the essay by its main content falls into the class dealing with the origin of man. Similar reasons determined the inclusion in this set of the treatise on love. That on eternity and time is placed in this third Ennead in virtue of its treatment of time, that on nature, contemplation, and the one, because of the discussion of nature contained in it. Next to the two dealing with the world comes the fourth Ennead containing the treatises dealing with the soul. Fifth Ennead following upon that dealing with the soul contains the treatises upon the intellectual principle, each of which had also some reference to the all-transcending, and the intellectual principle in the soul, and to the ideas. Last Ennead, the sixth, constitutes one other section, so that we have the entire work of Plotinus in three sections, the first containing three Enneads, the second two, the third one Ennead. Thus, in sum, I have arranged the fifty-four treatises, constituting Plotinus' entire work, into six sets of nine, to some of the treatises I have further added commentaries irregularly, as friends asked for enlightenment on this or that point. Finally for all the treatises, except that on beauty, which was not to hand, I have written summaries which follow the chronological order. In this department of my work besides the summaries will be found developments, the numbering of these also, adopts the chronological order. Now I have only to go once more through the entire work, see to the punctuation, and correct any verbal errors. What else has solicited my attention, the reader will discover for himself. This is brought to you by The Praetorian, on both YouTube and Facebook. Listen to our podcast on any of these platforms, Anchor, Breaker, Google Podcasts, Overcast, Pocket Casts, Radio Public, Spotify. Support us on Patreon. Check out our Discord server too. All the links are in the description below. Thanks for stopping by. We thank you for your participation. If you enjoyed please like, subscribe, share, make comments. We love feedback.